Welcome to American Muse Podcast, where we explore hidden secrets in the landscape of 19th and 20th century American orchestral music. Your host is Dr. Grant Gilman, conductor, violinist, and author based in Atlanta, Georgia. In each episode, Grant unearths a fresh orchestral work by an American composer you may not even know. And by the end, we hope you are a new fan of the composer and their music. Now, your host, Maestro Grant Gilman. Our guest today on the American Muse podcast hardly needs any introduction, but I'm going to do my best anyway. Um, Composer, conductor, trumpet player, and now author. He is a distinguished professor of music, leading the conducting and orchestral studies of the Frost School of Music at the University of Miami. His music director posts include the All-Star Orchestra, Palm Beach Symphony, the notorious Eastern Music Festival of North Carolina, and Mozart Orchestra of New York. He is conductor laureate of the Seattle Symphony, where he was music director for an outrageously impressive 26 years, and conductor emeritus of the Mostly Mozart Festival. His recording prowess totals over a massive 350 recordings on practically every recording label that matters in classical music, including this podcast's favorite, Naxos, which released a 30-CD box set of his recordings in 2017. For those of you too young, uh, CD stands for compact disc. It's flat, goes in a tray, spins very fast. Particularly of note for our focus, he has pioneered cycles of 26 American symphonists, including William Schumann, David Diamond, Walter Piston, Paul Creston, Peter Menon, Alan Hovannis, and Howard Hansen. After nearly five decades and still going as strong as ever, he's been recognized with copious awards, Grammy nominations, has a street named after him in Seattle near Benaroya Hall, which he helped to build, and even earned the honorary title of General by the state of Washington. His memoir, Behind the Baton, is available anywhere you buy books. My copy is digital on Kindle. Believe it or not, there is even more to be learned about him on his website, GerardSchwartz.com. Here he is, General Maestro Gerard Schwartz. Welcome. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Thank you so much. The very lovely introduction. That was very sweet of you. So I tried to get inside your head. I guess you you have you have lots of stuff besides your your memoirs. I mean, you you've you've actually written a lot. Maybe not just writing. There's the writing, and there's the interviews, and there's the you know of, with all the recordings. There's there's plenty of stuff that you've written. But I I tried to get inside and and I guess see what it was that you came from. And, and how how your career went, because, you know, uh, being a conductor, that's that's always interesting to me. And and of course, the, the, the advice that was always given to me was, you know, how do you become a conductor? And everybody says, um, well, it's it's different for everybody. And I was like, well, that's not very helpful. <laughs> so uh, but I, I was just trying to get through all of it. And as I went through all of this stuff that you've written and read all of your stories, it's it's. I realized the overwhelmingness that you don't really ever stop. You're kind of one of these people that you just like you're just like going and going and going and and I kind of imagined your personality to be um you're just hungry all the time and and hungry and curious and and just always going. Did I did I get it at least close to right with any of that? <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly right. Uh and I guess in some ways to be, I think, you know, I, I'm going to say something that's probably not accurate, but to be a great conductor, you have to be curious. Uh, to be a great musician, I should say, you have to be curious. No, that's not true. You can play the Rachmaninoff Third Piano Concerto as well as anyone in the world and, and not know anything of, of Schreckers or not know anything of Zemlinsky. I mean, you know, it, it, but on the other hand, curiosity is one of the keys, I think, to longevity. It's one of the keys to excitement and enjoyment of music and to constantly delve into the music in the highest level, whether you're delving into a Brahms symphony or into a piece I was working on today, Requiem Canticles of Stravinsky, you're, you're, the mind is working in the same way, looking at those notes on the page, trying to make sense out of them. And of course, your question, how do you become a conductor? And everyone says, you know, everyone has their own path. That's true. I mean, I can make some generalizations about an answer to that, but one thing for sure is curiosity, 
knowledge, knowledge of repertoire, knowledge of people, knowledge of instruments, knowledge of, of everything is of crucial importance. And, uh, you know, someone recently wrote to me, a high school student and said, you know, I want to be a conductor. What should I do? What, what, who should I study with? And of course, the answer is you study music. You study everybody and every piece. And you study and you study and you study. You expose yourself. Have you ever heard today in one of my, one of my groups, I said, have you ever heard the symphonic ode of Copeland? Nobody had ever heard the symphonic ode of Copeland. I mean, I think it's one of his greatest works. So if I had been in that audience, immediately, so I'm out of boat, I'm going home, phew, symphonic ode, what's that like? Uh, you know, that's, that's what we do. And then the other thing we do is conductors is we look at the notes on the page. I mean, as, as, as simplistic as that may sound, how do you study scores? How do you, you know, <laughs> I look at the notes on the page. I mean, that's really what we do and, and try to see everything that, that can be seen. Uh, and you still miss things. It's a, uh, it's a fascinating, wonderful world. And I think, if you're excited by that world, uh, yes, you're always doing, you're always moving forward. You're never standing still. And I think it's the excitement and the curiosity that does that. Right. So, so you have all of these experiences and, and of course the, the focus of this podcast is, is 19th and 20th century American composers. And you have a plethora of experience, not only with the pieces, but of course, with with some of these people, so so let's let's start with with uh, Hovannis. Um, so you mentioned that you met him at the age of sixteen while recording his "Return and Rebuild the Desolate Places" for trumpet and band. I got to say that I found this piece quite unique for Hovannis on the whole, though it does seem to be consistent with his wind repertoire. I guess I, I didn't know it as as well as the orchestral repertoire. Um, how, how did this meeting come about, and what did you think of him at such a young, impressionable age? Well, the meeting came about because there was a, a band director in a high school, West Caldwell High School, named was Keith Bryan. And Keith was like a, a Pied Piper for wind music. He played the flute, and he wanted to create a professional band. So he created one called the North Jersey Wind Symphony, I think. I mean, already North Jersey. I was, oh God, really? Anyway, he did. <laughs> I've and lived he, there. I understand. Yeah. <laughs> he, got, he got what he thought were the best players that he could find in New York who were willing to do that. And then he played concerts and made some recordings. And he was a great fan of Hovannis, of Hovannis's music. And I was his first trumpet and I was in high school still. And he said, would you play this piece? And I said, of course I played this piece. I, uh, I mean, I was, I, I was and am a yes person. Basically, people ask me things and I try as much as I possibly can to say yes. I mean, you can't say yes all the time, but as much as I can, I say yes. So he said, oh, sure. So it turns out that when I was uh, young, uh, 16, there was a very famous brass store on 52nd and Broadway called Giardinelli's. It doesn't exist anymore. And, you know, we would go there, my friends, I would go there once a week and try trumpets and try mouthpieces and get a glimpse, sometimes some famous brass player would walk in. Oh, was over there. <laughs> Matt Craig, there's there. Right? Anyway, um, and it turned out that this was, this was a terrible neighborhood in a way. I mean, it was all flop houses. I mean, it wasn't like it is now, you know. <laughs> this, is, this is before, this is, this is before fifty-seven. It was just when Lincoln Center was, was gentrifying the Upper West Side, but it hadn't gone to 52nd Street yet. So <laughs> Robin Nellies was in this kind of a, uh, a dump. And lo and behold, I met Hovannis there because he lived there in that kind of floppish house. And uh, this is Alan Hovannis. Oh, I'm playing your return and reveal. Oh, isn't that nice? And he was a very soft-spoken. He was never excited by very much. And, uh, and that was our first meeting. And I love the piece. I mean, it was just beautiful. Someone, you know, when we were young, and I try to continue this tradition, we would always talk about being vocal in the way we played. Now, you're playing something aggressive and hard and pumping away, it's different. But in general, you want to, if you, I, I, I say it all the time, sing that phrase. I said to a flute player today, she was playing a phrase about something like, let's say it went, la da dee da da. 
Well, you would never sing da da de da da. <laughs> you would sing da da de da da. There would always be a taper. Right. It was natural. So I'd say, no, 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 no. Taper. Tape. As if you were singing. And then I say to some, I want you to sing this passage and in a lyrical passage and see what's natural. And then all of a sudden, that whole concept of the vocal way of playing was was one that that very much a part of our youth, not so much a part of, uh, of, of the tradition today. So uh, you start saying that, people start saying, and Hovhannis' music is full of that, singing, singing, singing. And so I loved it. And uh, and I got to know him, you know, just a little bit at that time. And then I really got to know him, obviously, when I was in Seattle, because he lived there. Because of that, I started doing some of his pieces and then started recording some and then recording more because they sold. People were interested. People loved his music. Um, as I do, I do now. I, I say more now than then because so many of his pieces sounded the same to me. Uh, you know, the aleatoric sessions sounded the same, the lyrical sound, the little fugues. And then it wasn't until I got older that I started to really understand the depth of what he was doing and that it wasn't as quite as simplistic as I thought. And it, it became very touching to me. And I got to know him quite well. I remember once doing a Hovhannis festival in Seattle. And, and of course, I wanted to do a lot of pieces. It's very hard. So you have four concerts. We used to have four concerts a week. So I could do, let's say, two different programs. But if I got the University of Washington Wind Ensemble involved, they could play a, a different band piece on each of the concerts. So all of right. a sudden I have, you know, two pieces and they have two. And all of a sudden you have a real great variety. And in a week, you know, we, I think we probably did eight symphonies in a week uh, because you got other people involved and, it, and people just loved it. People loved the music. So the great thing about music of that type is if you expose people to it, number one, they'll understand the language. So Hovhannis's language becomes very clear. It would, it's a Japanese influence section, or whether it's an Armenian influence piece, or whether it's right. a, a, a Chinese influence piece, or whatever. It, it, you, but you still always have the essence of his personality, and I think audiences actually respond to composers who they can identify with and understand. I do want to go follow this thread a little bit about the the simplicity thing. When, when I first started s studying. Actually, when I first started hearing Hovhannis' music, it didn't occur to me that there was this this uh, this thinking that Hovhannis had had simple music. But then, when I started really studying and like reading about other people's opinions, then it started to come out like, "Oh, well, Hovhannis is simple, and youth orchestras typically play Hovhannis' music, so it's all very easy." And I was like, "I don't, I don't hear that." But okay, I mean, you know, it was it was. I mean, I don't mean to make you feel too old, but it was before my time. You know, I wasn't really born yet. So, in fact, <laughs> we'll, we'll put, to put it into perspective later. Uh, there's there's one program you made that I, I was really interested in. Um, it was like 80, 81 in, uh, w with the Los Angeles um, Chamber Orchestra. And um, that's when I was born. So... <laughs> <laughs> That's, that's to a, me now. <laughs> yeah, right, right. Uh, no, 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 but it just puts it into perspective. But, but I was thinking, okay, well, maybe, maybe youth orchestras. Uh, certainly, uh, um, the term of of community orchestras was definitely different back then than it is now. I think. So, as I went, as I followed that thread, as far as you're aware, was he cognizant of that characterization? I mean, did it did it really matter to him, even if he was? Well, the only time it really mattered to him. The only time I, that I that I'm aware of was I was doing his uh, quadruple few, you know, and I was talking about how wonderful it is, and and he said, you know, he basically in his very very sweet way said, yes, I could write good fugues, and four part fugue was one of my specialties. I could always do that, and he said, basically, it's such a shame that when people study fugues. In their in their schools and in their in their music books, and no one ever studies my fugues. It's the only time I ever heard him say anything like that. But you are right. Um, I remember when I did Mysterious Mountain, the third symphony, which of course we know wasn't the third symphony, and he didn't even name it. We know right. all those stories, right, which right, are right, right. horrible stories. Um, we did it with the All Stars, um, and 
He also has many books, Philadelphia, Boston, uh, New York Philharmonic, Met, you know, great, great players and lots of the great orchestras. And many of them, I don't mean one or two, but I mean probably 15 of them came to me and said, how come we don't know this music and don't know this composer? People from the Boston Symphony said they don't ever remember having played anything of his. Now, that's probably not true. They probably had, or maybe not. But, uh, but certainly Kusevitsky did. I mean, the, you know, he, the, people did, but that was a long time ago. And, uh, it, and, and in a way, it was one of the reasons why I wanted to do it so badly, because... Yes, youth symphonies play it. When I got the, the play, I, I wrote to his publisher, Peters, I think, and I said, give me the list of all the performances because it's a rental piece. So you have a list of everybody who's ever rented it. I right. said, for the last 10 years, give me the list of who's rented uh, this. And it was it was pages and pages and pages, like three or four pages, of people having played it. I would say, besides me, there were maybe three professional orchestras in all of those pages. It was it was mostly youth orchestras, and it was high school orchestras, and it was community orchestras. Um, you know, hopefully, that's changing. Uh, he, people like his music. The audiences like his music. I like his music. You know, I, I'm quite interested in because you know it's hard. It's hard. Uh, probably most books or, or or musicology things that are written about someone, especially about someone that's more recent, they probably didn't necessarily know. The person. So I, I wanted to know, you know, more about about that personality. In in your book, um, you tell the story of asking uh, Janos Starker to premiere Hovhannes's cello concerto, except he found it quote a little simple. So you got them together to enhance the cello part. I'm paraphrasing, but um, so that seems like a very delicate situation to say the least. Now, and and that's and that's in in a best case scenario that's a delicate situation so is is that often I'll, I'll ask it in a general way just for for you know for the audience is that often a viable option with composers you know that are living or does it depend on the personality it depends on the personality no question but i have i remember i won't tell this i won't tell you who the composer was i don't think i wrote about it there was a, 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 a what i consider a, a great composer who wrote a piece that i commissioned and he, he wrote in a way that was very severe, and that's not what I was expecting. And the piece was very long and hard. And I said to him, you know, after I studied the score, I said, gee, I didn't expect this. This is really harsh, uh, powerful, but it's, you know, 40 minutes or 35 minutes of this, it's a lot. Uh, it seems to me like could use a few cuts, you know, make it, make it palatable. Oh, can't do that. It's fine. He's a composer. I'm not. That's fine. So we went through the first rehearsal. And as soon as the rehearsal was over, we did pretty well, I thought. It was in New York. He cut about 15 minutes in the piece. The piece became a huge success, played by every major orchestra in the country. New York Philharmonic took it on tour. Uh, was it because of me? No, he probably would have done it anyway. But I gave him the, the, I gave him the idea and allowed him to say, you know, I... Every note I write is wonderful, but maybe there are too many here. Right. Maybe the permission to, to take yeah, it out in it. Exactly. Now, in the case of Hovhannes, Hovhannes was the sweetest, docile, wonderful man. I mean, there were moments when he wasn't, but almost always. And the case with Yano Stark was very easy. I mean, it was Dennis Davies was coming to conduct in Seattle. We had a recording session available. I wanted to record this piece. Dennis was a close friend of uh, Hovannis, so I asked him if he would do it. And he said if Janos would do it. And Janos was a close friend of Dennis's and a close friend of mine. So I sent Janos the music. Now, Janos, he wants to play a cello concerto. And it was, it was simple. And it, it, you know, he's a, Janos was one of the great technicians ever to play the cello. And for him to play, you know, very simple quarter notes and half notes the whole time, he said, you know, Jerry, it's nice and yeah, but it could be i think that as a it's not a real concerto i need a, a vehicle i need something and i put them together and hovannis had no problem he was very happy to take janos's suggestions i, I mean that's not the, you look at, at at great composers now sometimes you know uh, 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 Rubenstein, Anton Rubenstein said to Tchaikovsky, the first piano concerto is unplayable, you have to change it, and he refused. And Tchaikovsky was right. Other times, 
composers, if you look at the Brahms Violin Concerto and you look at the two versions, the one that Brahms wrote originally and what Joachim changed it to, right. he took a lot of suggestions from Joachim. He should. I mean, right. in the end, it is still the composer's decision. And I mean, the, the problem with Bruckner is that every time someone made a suggestion, he changed it. So we get all these versions and, you know, what <laughs> version of Bruckner are you going to do? Oh, God, I'm going to do the Ha, so I'm going to do the, the, the you know, it just gets, it gets so uh, complicated. But most composers have strong wills and strong personalities. So the way that you, you describe the personality of, of Havanis is, is, is pretty much the sense that I got that he's, that he is this soft-spoken not necessarily a pushover, but but kind of very like like okay, uh, he's got his focus on the the main goal, which is which is that he wants his music played, he wants to have an effect on people, whatever, all those things that are that are far superior to being right in the moment. He's not he's not necessarily hard headed. Okay, Absolutely. so now the there are some other anecdotes which are pretty strong. Um, one thing is that it it's it. I, this was interesting, an interesting find I had that somebody speculated that he has or he had um, hypergraphia, which I don't know if you know what that is, but it's it's normally attributed to writing and painting. It's where you you have this compulsion to constantly write. You have to write or draw all the time. You just have to do it over and over again. And of course, he was remarkably uh you know, proliferous, just like output was just like nonstop. And he's got all these symphonies and pieces and just all. So that could have been possible, I guess, but I, I don't know where that, that particular you it, know, it idea certainly, came from. It certainly would make sense. Right. I right. mean, I remember, I remember the Hinako calling me, Oh, Jerry, guess what? I just found another symphony in the basement. <laughs> you know, <laughs> Supposedly he wrote sixty-seven symphonies, but I can tell you, I have a whole pile that that aren't you know that that are beyond that sixty-seven. That right. he, wrote, he wrote a lot, and I think any composer that writes that much is always in trouble. I mean, obviously Martinu is like that. Martinu was a great composer, but he wrote so much that you know, well, what are we going to play? Which piece? Of, look at Haydn's symphonies. That's my favorite story. I think they're all great. Not one exception. They're all great pieces. But there's so many of them that it, it, unless they have a name, you know, the, the Miracle, the London, the drum roll, the military, you know, the philosopher, those are the famous ones. And all the others, number 67, number 79, you know, it's like, oh boy. And it's, it's an example that he wrote so many that ex, you know, a handful are known and, and none of the others. So even here I am, a great Haydn lover, and having conducted a lot, I, I, I should count them up how many I've done, but I probably only conducted about 50 of them, of the 104. Uh, you know, you think that's a lot, but gee whiz, that means a majority of them I haven't ever conducted even. Right. So, which, is, which is pretty wow. remarkable after 50. <laughs> <laughs> but it fits into that category of having written so much that it's almost like, oh, God, what should I do? How, what piece should I do? And Martinu fits into that uh, as well, right? So he and he he also had this that that one story, may, maybe not necessarily connected to this one particular event, but I think it was at Tanglewood. He went to Tanglewood, and Bernstein was there. I can't remember exactly who else, but it was a few other people that were pretty big at the time. And, and Bernstein had already been there a few Lucas times. Foss was there at the time, yeah, right? right. Lucas Foss and Cope. so and Oakland. and I think they picked on him. And he really took it hard. And I don't think that was the only thing that happened, but that was a big thing. And so he left unceremoniously and then he went home. And I it probably between that and, and in the name of trying to clean the slate for himself, he burned a whole bunch of his, his music that he had written up to that point, which is even more remarkable thinking about how much he has written that we still have to think that all of the music that he written, uh, that he burned, and I think he did that twice to some extent. Like he didn't burn everything, but he he twice he burned some of his stuff. I, I, you know, Grant, I think the story is true. Um, and of course, if you know the personalities, you know whether it's uh, you know uh, Lucas and, and, and Lenny and so forth, and then you see poor Alan. I mean, he could be very strong, and he and I, I, I've seen him uh, be assertive. But generally speaking, he's not. He's not. He's not a type A. 
right. just doesn't, and, and picking on him would have been easy for them. Right. Uh, these men were just so brilliant, and they were trying to show off their brilliance as much as possible. Allen was never a show off, ever, ever, ever. I th- they were probably pretty young too. So those they were two things, yeah, yeah. The young you're even more of a show off. Yeah, you're... right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's that's never a good combination. <laughs> What has been the most surprising piece that you've recorded or performed of his that, that you that you brought to life? Well, uh, you know, as soon as you saw that, I said, oh, God, there's so many pieces. What am I going to say? <laughs> <laughs> um, I would say the Mount St. Helens Symphony, which is symphony, I think it's 50. Um, Mount St. Helens Symphony, I think I've actually recorded it twice. It is a little longer than most. It has all the elements of the of the, the aleatoric section, the big percussion, the, the fugues, as all the stuff, the great lyrical ma- material. But it's quite long. And when I first was going to do it, um, I think I did the second or third performance of it, and I did it in Seattle. I was a little nervous because it's I, I don't remember the length, forty five minutes, something like that. It's a lot. Of, it's a, it's a long time. You do ten minute piece, no problem. Fifteen minute. Piece, 45 minutes or 40 minutes, uh, that's tough on the audience. Audience went out of their minds. Every time I've ever done that piece, the audiences have gone crazy for it. Hmm. And that was, in a way, the most surprising because I thought, you know, you do 15 minutes of Hovannis, easy. Mysterious Mountain, how long is that? 18 minutes, whatever it is. Right. 40 minutes. And that was the most surprising thing when, when, and I enjoyed it. As well, by the way, I enjoyed conducting it. I enjoyed hearing it. And then to have this large audience go crazy. Wow, what a thrill. And I think it had to do with the programmatic elements. Because, of course, I've done it and I did it in Liverpool. I did it in a lot of places. But um, especially at that time, you know, Mount St. Helens is not far from Seattle. It's in the the Pacific Northwest. And so they really identified. That's what I thought. Then I did it in Liverpool and they went crazy there, too. Um, and so in a way, that's probably the most surprising. And then, of course, the other piece that has to be very surprising is in God Created Great Wells. Right. I mean, that was really interesting to do, especially on the Delos recording, because uh, I remember uh, I recorded it, you know, and 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 Amelia Haygood and, and Carol Rosenberg were at Delos, went to the National Oceanics somebody, uh, and got some new whale songs. So, you know, there's a tape. <laughs> In those days, probably now it's computer general, but whatever, it was a tape that you put on and the whale sounds would come in in the piece. People really loved it. So did I. But they got new whale songs because, you know, whales sing. Right. And songs are just incredible. So, yeah, wow. So, so I, but I completely forgot about it. And then uh, a conductor called me up maybe a year ago and said, oh, Maestro, you know, we're doing this God created great whale. Well, you know, great. He said, but, but uh, the, the tape of the whale sounds are, are not very good. And it's not the whale sounds that you used. How, how did you get those whale calls? <laughs> I remember. I wonder if Carol Rosenberger at Delos still has those. And so I said, call up Delos and see if they still, I don't know the answer to that. So now let's, let's pivot um, both composers and characters. So to a starkly different character, Mr. David Diamond. Uh, it seems anyway to me. I don't know him. You do. After his death in 2005, you related the story of Diamond ragging on you for not using a large enough string section for his piece, Rounds. Uh, You also wrote about his socking Artur Rodzinski in the face for not letting him hear the New York Phil reading his second symphony. Uh, So this certainly paints a picture of a very perspicacious personality. Is that how you found him? Uh, you know, David was like a member of our family. We loved him. The kids loved him. When he, he, he was honorary composer in residence in Seattle, he'd come out all the time. I'd play all his music. He'd come out, he'd stay with us in our house. Uh, I mean, we just adored him, loved him. He was one of the most brilliant uh, people you'd ever meet. Gracious, thoughtful. But he also had a tremendous temper. And if you got him at the wrong end of that temper, oh boy, he could be vicious. Usually after he's had a few martinis. Uh, not, not 
often without. But I remember, I don't know if I re- told this story in the book, but um, uh, we were doing some concerts with Rostropovich and uh, Slava was coming to dinner and David was there as well. And I said to David, David, why don't you have dinner with us uh, tonight? Uh, Rostropovich is coming. It'll be fun. We have, you know, because David speaks some Russian. I mean, it, it would, you know, they would, they get along great, I thought. And he went into a tirade about how Slava never plays his music, never programs his piece with the National Symphony because he was music director there then. And I said, and I, as nicely as I could, I said, David, what about this? Maybe he doesn't identify with it. Maybe he may even love it, but he doesn't feel it doesn't resonate with him, and so he doesn't feel comfortable programming it. And there's hardly a conductor in the world that is comfortable with every composer. Even if they lie, I said there was a time when I wouldn't conduct Von Williams symphonies. I, you know, and now I love them, but there was a time when I just they didn't res- resonate with me. There's that possibility. It's not that he probably loves you. And he probably even likes your music, but it's not for him. And when I told him that story, he said, "Oh, okay, I'll come," and he did, and we had a fabulous time. And David never beat him up for not doing his music. I mean. The reality is composers, it's very personal, right? I write a piece, I want you to love it. Right. And most composers, you do a piece of theirs and, the, and, and they come back after the concert, oh, isn't it wonderful? Now, what about this piece? What about that? You didn't do this. You know, it's like, it, it, you know, you, you try to do the best you can, but then if they want more. I don't blame them because it's personal for them. I don't blame David. He wanted people to play and love his music. Right. On the other hand, um, uh, and and I can tell other stories of where he was a, a, a very tough cookie. But in general, he was the sweetest, most brilliant, sensitive person and, and very close to all of us. Right. Well, I mean, that makes sense. That makes sense. I wasn't trying to paint him as, you know, a monster. But <laughs> No, no. But there was a moment. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> um, so you told another story um, when the Eastman Theater was was first renovated in 2004. And the year before, it was the year before Diamond died, and he was asked to write the fanfare for the opening concert for Rochester Philharmonic. And though he agreed, he only wrote three loan chords, and you ended up finishing the piece in the style of the composer himself. You picked a little from here, a little from there, put it all together. And, and as miraculous as a, uh, of a story it is for you, it seems to intersect with another tale of, of Diamond's career. He, he obviously spent one single year at Eastman studying with Hansen, and then left pretty unceremoniously, and it doesn't seem like it was very nice. So now a music writer, uh, Michael Steinberg, he openly suggested, now this is a quote, this is not me, he said, Hansen disliked Jews, and he disliked homosexuals, and he disliked modernists, and David Diamond qualified in all of those categories. Now, I have nothing but the utmost respect for Hansen's music and accomplishments at Eastman, obviously. I mean, let's like... As part of you know the music and the the accomplishments that he has, or he had, you know, are part of what this whole genre that I'm focusing on is 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 all about. But do you believe that there is enough truth in that statement, and might that experience have ruined any possible relationship between the school and David Diamond thereafter, and and partially brought about that that circumstance even at the end of his life that's a very interesting um observation i, I don't know the answer because i never met hansen there were always those stories he certainly didn't especially care for uh severe music yet he played a reasonable amount he certainly was has been known to be homophobic and anti-semitic whether he was or not i don't know but he played music of homosexuals and he played music of Jews. So, uh, you know, <laughs> I don't know the answer to those questions. Right. And I wasn't there. Uh, David uh, spoke, spoke very, very uh, nicely about Howard Hansen. Uh, often he called him, you know, Howard this and Howard that. But he certainly did not have a success in Rochester. All the years that David taught at Juilliard, he lived in Rochester. He commuted, can you imagine, in the wintertime, with all right. snow, even till, practically till he died, commuted to teach at Juilliard from Rochester, where he lived in this beautiful little house 
I'm surprised the house we had so many books. I'm surprised that it didn't collapse from the weight <laughs> of all the books. But uh, he was not. I remember a uh, long time ago being asked to do a concert with the Rochester Philharmonic, and I this just goes back many years. I'm sure no one there uh, uh, is a, uh, has any memory of this because they're all long gone. That's how long ago it was. How many? 30, 40 years, something like that. And they said, they wanted me to come and guest conduct. And I said, sure, I'd like to come and do a program of Hanson and Diamond. And uh, they said, no, I don't want to do that. And I said, and I was young, I was a kind of hot conductor, you know, and I said, oh, I would really, I'd love to come. But I really, I mean, those are your people. Hanson lived there, Diamond lived there. Oh, no one will come. And I said, well, look, maybe, maybe get someone else. I really would like to come, but uh, probably not a good idea. I was, you know, I was, I was young. I probably shouldn't have said that, but anyway, I didn't go. So the next year they asked me again, would I come? And I said, yes, but I wanted to. <laughs> I'm in and Hanson. That's the and, price. <laughs> and they let me. And we did two concerts, both sold out. And huge reception. And it was very exciting and fun. But they were also willing to to take a chance on their people. How many how many orchestras do you know? My favorite story, of course, is how how much William Schumann is played by the New York Philharmonic. He was the president of Juilliard. He was the president of Lincoln Center. Uh, he was responsible for a lot of the great uh, uh, innovations at Lincoln Center and at Juilliard. And the New York Philharmonic almost never plays a piece of his. Really, his name should be on one of the buildings. <laughs> and 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 they should. He wrote eight great symphonies. They should do. Yeah. They should do every year one, and yeah. then every eight years they should rotate and do do it again. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's. I don't understand uh, how those uh, things happen. The fanfare, though, was an interesting uh, phenomenon because David stopped composing. So it's two thousand three when he was stopped, and. Uh, 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 Sam, who was taking care of him, said, you know, they asked for a piece. And I said, how did it go? And he said, well, David agreed. I said, oh, okay. Maybe he has it in him. So, you know, so six months later, the orchestra calls up, maybe it was whatever. I, you know, I, I won't get all the facts exactly right. And said, where's our fanfare? And so Sam Elliott, Sam Elliott, went to David and said, where's the fanfare? And he said, oh, oh here it is. And I said, but David, there were only three chords. He said, that's, uh, that's fine. So anyway. That went on like that for a while. Then I get a call from Sam saying, you know, Rochester really, Philmont really wants this fanfare. Uh, so they want to have a ghostwriter write a piece and call it David Diamond. And I said, Sam, you can't do that. That's just out of the question. You know, I remember, I read that story that you wrote out. Is that as weird to you as it seems to me? Like, I know that that's pretty common in writing. I mean, that's like grossly common in writing. I have never heard of that in composition. I never did either. I don't understand it all. But that, that's what Sam told me. Now, you know, maybe maybe it, 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 that's, what I, that's what he said to me. I said, you can't have a ghost. I said, I'll tell you what I'll do. I will write the fanfare. But they won't be my notes. They'll be David's notes. So every note in that fanfare, I think every note, is David's. Uh, uh, I took some stuff from Tom. I took some, maybe I reorchestrated a few things, but I mean, basically they were David's. I took things, the fanfare from his concerto for chamber orchestra. I mean, I did a whole bunch of, I mean, I got all this diamond fanfare like stuff and with percussion and I put it together and, you know, I thought it was pretty darn good, but they, they, I guess they thought it was too difficult because it was hard. And cause a lot of the Tom stuff was in five, eight, man. And they only did like a half of it. They cut the whole middle section out, uh, which I found out later because I was doing a concert of David's music at Juilliard. And I said, oh, I'd like to do the fanfare. And the parts came and they say, oh, are we going to do the same cuts they did in Rochester? Ooh. <laughs> anyway, at Juilliard, we had no trouble playing those parts. <laughs> and, and, uh, and, and I still have. I still have a copy of the front page of the fan. Oh, David loved it, by the way. Because, you know, he recognized me. He was still right. <laughs> I was, I mean, he, was, right. He, was, he was old and all that. And 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 he, you know, took the first and signed it for me because he liked it so much. But I didn't take credit for it. It was David Diamond, I think I said arranged or something like that. 
pieced together, maybe <laughs> yes, together. <laughs> pulled together. Now let's let's go let's go a little further with Tom because I wanted to talk about that. So you were able to premiere the first orchestral suite from Tom, and it seems like it, it was a great success. And on the other hand, it seems the full ballet still has yet to be produced. Now nearly eighty five years after it was written. So I know this is this is kind of an impossible question, but how does this kind of omission happen? Um, was it possibly the fact that he was only in his 20s at the time? Maybe he hadn't gained enough recognition to carry it forward past the first failed production? Was it something maybe more akin to uh, a desire for safety and recognizable music and ballet productions? It's It's a complicated question because... It's based on the Beecher Stowe's book, Uncle Tom's Cabin. Uncle Tom, if you call someone an Uncle Tom, that's a derogatory term. When, when Cummings wrote the scenario to Tom, which is based on the Beecher Stowe book, nobody would touch it, even then. So even he, then. Asked, yeah, he asked, I think, Lincoln Kirstein, was Ballet Caravan, which was a precursor for the New York City Ballet, asked, I, I can't remember exactly who now, I think they asked Roger Sessions, I'm pretty sure they asked Roger Sessions to do it, he turned it down. Maybe Stravinsky, I'm not sure, but he asked a bunch of composers showing the libretto, I mean, showing the scenario that Cummings wrote, and everybody turned it down. So it, it was not, it, it just didn't exist. Balanchine was supposed to do the choreography, but there was no music, so they didn't do it. Uh, David, when he was 19, found a copy in a, in a bookstore of the Cummings uh, scenario. He took it, he read it, loved it, went to Patson Place in the village, knocked on the door, typical David story, and Cummings answered the door. And David said, I'm a young composer, can I write the music for your <laughs> talk? <laughs> Cummings said, sure, go, go do it. And he did, without any production in mind, without anything, just he wrote it. Right. And the fact that he couldn't get it done, it doesn't surprise me. Okay, so let's let's lighten it up a little. So going back to rounds, that kind of key piece, um, it seems that from Diamond's perspective, it was not a typical work in his style, despite its lasting opportunity. That's, of course, not a... Uh, not an atypical thing that happens, you know, to composers, to bands, to to pop, you know, you write one really big hit and then that becomes your piece, even though you're like, but but that's not that's not all I am. But that's the one that everybody remembers you for um, you in your uh, Deutsche Grammophon article from last year. You tout the merits of his uh, his second symphony written in 1942 at the height of World War Two. Um, certainly. These two works differ in character, scope of dynamism, range of expression. And I agree with all three respects. The symphony surpasses the rounds completely. Is this symphony a better example of Diamond's style than the rounds, do you think? Mm, that's interesting. Um, David's first four symphonies are very clear examples of his style uh, from you know, from the early 40s until 45, 46. I think Rounds fits into that, I do. It's a lot of counterpoint. Every symphony has a lot of counterpoint. Mm. Very melodic second movement. Every slow movement of every symphony is quite beautiful. If you listen to the slow movement of the fourth symphony, written the same time as the Rounds, and the slow movement of the Rounds, there's a similarity of sound and a beauty of melody. Diamond told me how said, Aaron used to be very jealous of my melodic ability, you know, talking about Copeland. Um, <laughs> and then uh, the last movement of the rounds, you know, like the last one of the fourth symphony is, is a very heavily contrapuntal uh, piece. Now, rounds is his most popular, much more popular than the second symphony would ever be. But it goes back to that discussion we had earlier about uh, Mount St. Helens symphony. The second symphony has got to be 42, 43 minutes long. The rounds is 13 minutes. I'm, I'm not sure, but something like that. To do a 13 minute piece, easy, easy. Anybody can do it. And if it doesn't, if it's not successful, it's still only 20% of the program. 
you do a 42 minute piece and it's not successful. Right. The audience says, Hey, I paid 10 bucks for this and I'm only getting $5 that I like, you know, right. <laughs> my money back. I think it fits into the, to his, to his uh, uh, style of writing. So Tom is a precursor. He was 19. It's a little simplistic. It doesn't have the kind of, the, it has the drama, but maybe not the, the, all of the, uh, the, uh, contra- all of the, uh, technical abilities, but by the time you get to the second symphony, first symphony even, and then getting moving forward to the rounds, I mean, it's just he's just a, a great master of the technique. Fugue, Allah, he loves fugue. I mean, I I remember uh, when I studied with Creston Ormandy, he said, "Guess what?" The, Ormandy called me and he wants me to write a new piece for the Philadelphia Orchestra. I said, oh, "Wasn't that wonderful, Mr. Creston?" He said, "Yes." He said, "He I said he said I there was one request, and I said, what's that?" Ormandy said, no fugato. <laughs> because in those days, <laughs> 19, 1960, every American composer was writing a few all the time. Every That's piece right. had a few. And so Ormandy said, no fugato. Chris said, sure, no, no problem. <laughs> so I, think, I, think that, uh, I think the reason why the, the, the rounds are so successful is because it's great piece, no question. And it's accessible and it's short. Right. More accessible than almost anything else, probably. You know, that now that's interesting because the next thing I want to ask you about is programming. And, and, and that brings up something I hadn't actually quite thought of to put into this this particular question. But because it's only for strings, that's a unique issue that's that's going to come up a lot of the time because most things that that you're going to program for obviously is is for a full orchestra a season right and and putting um a string only piece on the program is not abnormal but it is it's quite a heavy choice it's a significant choice because then you have to kind of craft the entire program around that piece to consider you know all the other aspects like rehearsal time and and then the length of the piece and then how much more that's going to be on the strings and and you know all of that stuff um and additionally you know speaking of programming i mean david diamond is the perfect example to use so you discussed opening the 78 79 season of the la chamber orchestra with a program that included the rounds uh ravel sagan a Vivaldi Violin Concerto, The Sacred and Profane Dances by Debussy, and topped off by Schubert's Fifth Symphony. Now, that is brilliant. To me, that's brilliant. It's like perfect program. Now, I can't help but think that most audiences other than Los Angeles would not really readily accept that programming today. Do you think that's true? Or, or is, that, is it just a long-held limiting belief we have as concert programmers that poli- people will only show up if they recognize all the composers and pieces on the concert? Well, I think, I think uh, that was my opening program when I became music director of the LA Chamber Orchestra. First, first concert I ever did with them uh, as a music director. I think there are two issues here. One is getting the people in the seats, and one, the other is will they enjoy it once they're in the seats? I guarantee you, an audience today having that program of uh, uh, Diamond, Vivaldi, Ravel, uh, Debussy, and Schubert would be loved. 90% of the audience would love that. Getting them to sit in the seats, that's a different problem. Now, on that program, I had Elmar Oliveira was the violin soloist, and he had just won the Tchaikovsky competition. He was my ace in the hole. He Top was, of his he, game, I guess. And he was also playing Heifetz's Ravel Zagat. Now, can anyone besides Heifetz play the Ravel Zagat? <laughs> of course. <laughs> but that was, and, and the combination of Ravel and Vivaldi, you know, it's, uh, it's a very interesting combination that, you know, one could conjure up that, even though Heifetz never did that particular, con- I mean, it could have been. So I had that, ad- so once you have that advantage, so I had everybody wants to hear the guy that just won the Tchaikovsky competition. So that's that gives me leeway. Schubert Fifth, okay. People don't know Schubert symphonies really. They don't know the difference between one, two, three, four, five, six. They know the unfinished and the great, the ninth. Yeah, uh, that's it. Depending on the numbering, but that's it. They, you know, if I sang the Schubert Third, um, 
most people, you know, I, I don't know that piece. So to the way you're getting away with something because it's Schubert. Diamond, okay, that's a risk. But for me, as an American doing my first program with my new American LA Chamber Orchestra, I had to do an American piece. It's a guarantee. I would not do a concert without it. Hmm. Sacred and Profane Dances of Debussy is just, it's a piece that's in those days was rarely played. And it is so gorgeous and so beautiful. I thought, and it, it turned out pretty well. And it was, a, it, it was in a way, what you want to do when you open a season, um, you want to have something that's good for the orchestra to grow. So the Schubert is a real, is, is a, is a piece is a, that you can teach or you can make music with an orchestra on a kind of traditional level, like Brahms is for a big orchestra. Right. Uh, doing the rounds, it's very hard for a small string group. Uh, and, and, you know, so it was, I, I took all those things into consideration. And you're certainly right. Uh, doing a string orchestra piece is, is a, little, a little risky ever because if you have 90 musicians on the payroll or 100 musicians on the payroll and you use 40 of them, it's a little tricky. Um, on the other hand, let's say you're doing the Mahler Ninth Symphony and for the first half you're going to do you know, some, some Dvorak string serenade or the foot serenade or some other string piece. Well, isn't that a relief for the brass players and the wind players? They're not, you know, in, in, uh, you're going to have a big blow in the first half and then a big blow in the second. I remember when I was the first big tour I did when Bernstein was going to the Philharmonic, he, we did the Mahler fifth, but on the first half he did a Mozart piano concerto. I didn't play the Mozart. I was just, you know, backstage hanging out waiting for the Mahler to come. Smart programming. In a way, first of all, he was the soloist. It's, it, it works beautifully with Mahler. Mozart and Mahler work beautifully together. And nobody was taxed. Right. I remember, uh, uh, Grant, as you're a conductor, you'll, you'll appreciate this. Uh, so we were doing the Mahler fifth, I mean, almost every night, you know, and in Australia, New Zealand. And, and the personnel manager was a former first horn player, Jimmy Chambers. And Jimmy was a, a great horn player one of the greatest, but his career wasn't a long one. I think he stopped playing in his mid forties. And um, I remember being backstage during that time, you know, while the Mozart was going on and, and uh, you know, Mahler you know, has four trumpets. It has horn, eight horns, whatever the heck it is. And big, huge quadruple wins and so forth. And, and he said, uh, when I was playing, you go on tour, the big piece was a Brahms symphony. Now, you go on tour and the big piece is Mahler. He said, I can't imagine what that would have been like on his lip. Yeah, especially for, I mean, for a trumpet player, yeah. But even for a horn player, my God. Well, I mean, it was a, a whole different world from what it was when the big piece was Brahms. You know, interesting. All right. Now, now I'm going to go out on a limb here, it's speaking a little more about programming. And you can tell me whether whether this is, this is accurate or not. So from my perspective... Um, you have been able to program more works by your own choice than most other conductors are able to over their career. It, I find it admirable and possibly uh, should be a message for us that traditions we hold about pro programming may no, no longer be accurate or relevant if they ever were. Um, was that something you were cognizant of, these implicit limitations early on in your career, or did you just reject them from the start? I, I always felt and continue to feel that I'm a team player. So whenever I make programs, wherever it would be to this day, the first set of programs for a season, I always write first draft because I want people's input. Uh, I, you know, not board members, not necessarily even orchestra members, but uh, not that that would be bad, but administration. So, you know, you're doing a piece and you say, well, I'm going to do the, I'm going to do the Alpine symphony. And they say, oh, you can't do that because they're 12 all stage horns, too expensive. Well, Grant, you and I know there are only three horn parts. You don't have to have 12. Right, right. You can have six <laughs> and you can take four of them from the orchestra, you know, not that <laughs> but, but, Okay. But if someone says that, then he said, fine, I'll do something else. You, you don't have, you, you right. don't. You don't, uh, you, you pick your battles and there's lots of music. You know, I mean, it's, it's, that's really not a problem. I always have programmed American music. I love it. I care about it. 
I'm an American, even though I'm first generation. And, um, but I, I program it so that the audience gets to know the composer. So when I was in Seattle all those years, I wouldn't do one piece of Hanson. I would do all of them, all of the symphonies. And they would, after they hear the first one, which was number two, obviously. Right. I says, oh, that's pretty nice. And then they hear the first. Oh, I like that one. Then they hear the third. Oh, they like that. So all of a sudden, he's not, he's not a, uh, a, 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 a bad word. You know, Howard Hanson's good. We like Howard. Cause they understand the language. Right. So I think when you program, when I used to program, especially for a long season, like what we had in Seattle, I was always thinking about a, a, a many years, not just a season. Uh, you know, I want to do a Brahms symphony every year, no matter what. I'm going to do one, one of them. Every four years, I'll start again. Uh, I'm going to do a Strauss tone poem. I'm going to do a Mahler symphony. I'm going to do a lot of American music. Uh, and then you, know, you, you, you pick and choose. So if you have Van Cliburn playing the piano, you can put on anything you want. It won't matter. Or if it's Ock Perlman's playing. Right. No one well, nowadays, long, long, or you, Joanne, you, you can program anything. They're there because they will uh, uh, make the audience come. Right. But once you get them there, you've got to try to make them enjoy themselves. You know, you say, ah, I have long, long coming, so I can do some wild piece. You know, if, if, you, if, you, if you antagonize them too much, uh, they, they won't come back. I'm, so maybe the better way to put it is that you just you just happen to have really good taste. Well, I appreciate you saying that. But <laughs> I I try I try to to think of all the options and all the possibilities. I right. care deeply about the orchestra and I care deeply about the, the audience. And I want to make sure that's challenging enough for the audience and for the orchestra, and that the audience isn't going to say, "Oh, I hate his programs." And they don't come back. Right. I mean, there are many conductors who've lost their job, including Leopold Stokowski in Houston, because right. of his programming. Yeah. And now, on the other hand, if you look at Kusevitsky's programs in Boston during those years, they were the most innovative, uh, unusual that I've ever seen anywhere. In fact, many of them I thought just didn't make a lot of sense. But he was loved, right. and everything was sold out. And, and when you have something like that, then you can you can do stuff. If the audience trusts the conductor, the conductor can do things that are interesting. So it's possible that he just didn't build up that trust in Houston before laying it all on there. I think that's true. He was an older man. He said, why should I? Why should I how old is he? 70 something already. Yeah. I have to build. I'm Stokowski. I don't have to build trust. Right. Of course, you know, for his opening program, it was a mysterious mouth. He commissioned it for his opening concert as music director at Houston. Right. So even more generally, when you're when you're planning for an entire season, do you do you work with percentages to to an extent, a thematic approach sometimes? I mean, do you choose some large pieces or projects to work around and then fill in around them? Is it is it a little bit of all of those things? Maybe a little bit of all of those like, things. And you said you said sometimes it's a you know you, you get a soloist, so then of course that that's the centerpiece. And but is it? Well, I'll tell you I'll tell you a David Diamond story, which I think you'll like. David uh, knew more music than I did. Uh, I thought I always knew a lot. As I get older, I think I know less and less. But <laughs> David really, I mean. I could tell you stories about his memory and what he knew was incredible. So he'd always tell me, oh, you should do this piece, you should do that piece, all these things. And whatever, you know, every once in a while, I got the impression he didn't think I was taking enough of his advice about pieces. So one year with the New York Chamber Symphony, uh, I was programming, I think, eight concerts. And uh, I said to David, okay, let's do this together. All right, so let's come up with the list. First, come up with the list of pieces you want to do. And then, of course, the list was quite long, especially American stuff. Then we have eight soloists, and this is Toya, uh, and this soloist wants to do that, and this soloist wants to do that. Okay, fine. So now we're all set. We have this whole big, huge list of pieces. Okay, let's look at that. Let's look at them. So then we we fill in. First, we start with the concertos. Okay, so you know, uh, Pinky Zuckerman is playing, and he wants to do Beethoven concerto. Beta control. Fine. Now we could do that as a first half before intermission, or we could do it as a second half. Either way. Right, right. Then we have Melodia Feltzman, who's who's coming and he wants to do most of five nine five. So we put that in that. That'll be definitely before the intermission. So we go through that and we put we have so eight programs set. So now the concertos are set. 
So then I said, okay, good. Now we have, you know, these three premieres we're going to do. Right. David knew about those, including one of his probably, and we put the three premieres in. Okay. Now let's come up. We have the opening pieces. So what shall we do before the Mozart? Well, we don't want to do something modern. It's just, you know, it, it, it just, it's too jarring, a change. You know, sometimes when you get something with jarring harmonies and then all of a sudden you have Mozart, it's like, Mozart, what's that? You know, it's so, so you have to have something that's complimentary. So we filled in all the opening pieces. Well, now let's, let's get that. We have to do some Mozart and Haydn. And, you know, we have to do some of the traditional Beethoven repertoire, put all those in. It's almost nothing left. <laughs> And, and so he said, I want you to do the Rudy Stefan piece. I said, oh, okay, where, where can we fit that in? Oh, we can put it here, opening the second half, because the Schubert second isn't that long. But all of a sudden, David, who was always beating me up for not doing enough, realized <laughs> that it's not so simple. And, you know, you, 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 you try to do as much as you can, and you, you try to use good taste and good judgment, and you try to judge the audience, and you try to help it come together. Well, listen, Maestro, General, Jerry, whatever, you, whatever, <laughs> whatever your title is now, I, I'm going to go ahead and corner you into uh, joining me again. You have so many stories to get to in one interview. Uh, I absolutely want to ask you about uh, your teacher, Creston, how well you knew William Schumann, Copeland, and of course, what I imagine are a plethora of stories about Bernstein. Maybe I can even buy you a virtual beer and you can tell me the ones that are not suitable for broadcast. <laughs> I think that <laughs> those are the ones that I really want to hear. <laughs> it's a joy to talk to you. And anytime, I'd love to talk to you again. Absolutely. Absolutely. And then eventually when this is, uh, when everything is settled down, then I, I, I'll come and uh, I'll bring the podcast to you. Great. <laughs> How about that? Just here. All right. All Great. right. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. If you like what you have heard and want to support the advocacy of American orchestral music, please consider signing up to donate regularly at patreon.com for our continued production of this podcast. Also, subscribe for updates wherever you get your podcasts so you don't miss an episode.